Ladies and gent Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, may I kindly ask you to take your seats? We will have a, a shorter discussion um, just in a few minutes and uh, it will be about artificial intelligence and creativity in the value chain. So um, we will start a little bit more creatively with a little video and afterwards we will uh, welcome Lars Wick from IBM Nordic and um, Alfons Karabuda, our president. Welcome, Lars. So, please have a seat. So, for those of you who wonder, Lars is not the robot. Yes, you will actually meet the robot Pepper a bit later at the cocktail. Uh, and I'm not joking, so uh, please stay for that. Um, Lars, there is, of course, a buzz in not only the music industry or musical sphere about AI. Some of us use it, some of us want to use it, and some of us are afraid of it. I would like to ask you, first of all, when we talk about AI, artificial intelligence, where are we in a development? Is this new or is it almost, you know, are we at the end of a process? Could you describe it a bit for us just so we know what we have to expect? Yes, I'll, I'll try to do that. Uh, AI or, as you say, artificial intelligence or uh, uh, what we uh, in IBM call it, we call it cognitive computing, just to be a little bit special. Uh, cognitive has to do with senses, I mean, hearing, uh, smelling, etc. So we are adding a number of other factors to, to the, our AI systems. But AI came around, I would say, maybe 10, 12 years ago, for real. Uh, before that, it was called programming. You programmed computer to do different things, depending on, on circumstances, different actions, and, and, and you programmed a, a number of, of rules, etc., into computers. That time is more or less over. Right now, computers is starting to think, or maybe not think, but learn, you could say. Uh, so that's been around for the last 10 years. Uh, there was an IBM machine that won the US competition Jeopardy. Maybe some of you saw, saw, saw that TV show. Uh, won against the champions without being connected to internet. Just massive amount of data inside the computer, understanding the questions, understanding the different alternatives, and it won big times. So that was IBM's start of the AI journey. Uh, but to come back to your question, <laughs> Where are we on the curve? Uh, as many initiatives is triggered by something, in this case it's triggered by AI, then you have a number of enthusiasts or, 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 or fast movers who is thinking about this, this, this is sexy, let's, let's think about what we can use AI for. Then you normally have a curve look like that, you have the initiating things and then you go up and this build becomes more and more popular and it becomes a hype. Uh, so so uh, we, are, we, have, we have passed that hype peak, I would say, or the, 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 the point of, of uh, inflated expectations, which is more or less never reached. Then people are trying to do things with AI and the, that curve goes down and people get disappointed because they are testing, prototyping doesn't really succeed. And then you come to the, the point of, and this is another difficult word, uh, like... like uh, the other one, which is called, oh, so got that. But this word is disillusionment or disillusionment, where everyone is, is really, this doesn't really work. And then you start to pick up again, and you try to do some, some practical stuff with it. And then you come up to the plateau, which you can call the plateau of productivity. So where are we right now? Uh, I also work with the industrial sector, something called in Industry 4.0, coming from Germany, where IBM also have a lab in Munich. You have come up from that lower part, and they have started to really get AI into production. 
But in that case, you use creativity in innovation to make processes more efficient and more productive. I would say, without being a musical expert, but I'm very interested, uh, we have not reached that yet in the music industry. Because in our world, creation or creativity is the product in itself, I would say. So we have just come past the bottom part, and we are now gaining ground. But a little, little bit below the other, more industrialized, and like transportation, maybe healthcare, etc. So, but so which one is the furthest ahead, you would say? Because you work, uh, yeah. obviously, the, not just in the creative the industrial sector. industrial, where you have robots uh, making cars, and making fridges, etc. So they have come first. And they also have the financial driving forces that force them to do things and be competitive. But in my world, this is much more complex and interesting. So you have so many forces and many actors. And the music industry, as we heard from the panel here, you have so many actors, and the business model is really changing dramatically. So you, ha you have to understand how to use AI to strengthen your position in the value chain. And you told me, we, we had a, a talk on, on different companies and the development they've had uh, during the past 100 years. Um, and we have a lot of examples, of course, of those not being able to adapt. Uh, typewriters, we had a great uh, company called Fawcett. That was fantastic. But IBM is one of these old ones and has really changed the, in a way, they've just reinvented themselves, going from hardware, consultancy, and research. And that, I have to say, is a bit about you know, the same thing that we have done also in the music, music business or ecosystem. Is there something, do we have those kind of similarities, you say, and um, uh, would you say, and... Um, possibilities for us to help each other change better to uh, adapt to a future? I really think so, because IBM started in 1911, and I think we are now in our fifth generation of competition. Other companies have come around and disappeared. Uh, what may have made IBM survive for those years since 1911? It's a lot of years. It's 89 plus 20. It's now 109 years. So that's creativity and innovation in our labs. And the music industry is really about creativity and innovation. That also comes from below. No headquarters, no research centers, not even in IBM, is, is delivering the basic innovation. That is coming from the professionals, from the individuals. We have learned that during our journey. Our first 50 years, we relied completely on researchers in, 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 in white dresses and, 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 and etc. Now we are relying on individuals, and we are putting our researchers out in the field working in real projects. So I think we have that in common. That is, uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are creative, innovative, and, 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 and curious on new things. So I think if you combine AI and music and work with the ecosystems and the business models, we could succeed. I will just say one more thing, because in our world, in my world, in my profession, moving information around without adding any value, that is a dead business model, if you're not big enough. You see what I mean? Uh, and I don't like that, in, in principle. I mean, if you don't create value, create music, and being the composer, creator, just moving things around, that's not fair. In fact, I, I don't think that's the right business model, so we have to work on that. <laughs> that sounds very good, actually. Uh, I know that, um, I mean, often we, uh, we, we are told to use technology as creators to develop ourselves and our music and our business, but having, you know, artificial intelligence working in our field, do you think there's an opportunity also for the creators to more than now be part of, of the development? You mean part of the development of the AI systems? AI systems and, and what, it's, what it could be used for in our, yeah. Uh, yeah. For our community. Absolutely for the usage of it. Uh, I can take an example. I work a lot with the Swedish government up north and they had a mantra saying we will be the best in the world of developing AI. And I had to convince them that, no, you should not say that, because there are some, might be some other organizations like Google, Microsoft, and IBM who's working ex exactly on that. I don't think Sweden as a country are able to develop that, but we can be best of using AI. 
So they, in fact, changed that paragraph in, in, in that program. So, so if also in this case, AI is an assistant. It could be a lever to do much more things. I can take another example. You know, chess. IBM won the chess match against Kasparov in the 90s. Uh, and, and that was a, a big win for the machine. Now, when we when chess is played, there is something called mixed double in chess. So every time a human being and a machine is on one side, and either on the other side there's two machines or two persons, the combination of machine and persons wins every time. That's very interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's really, so I really believe in the combination of the human brain and the massive capabilities of the AI machines, because then you can take what you have, as we said here in the movie, in the video, with, 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 uh, with this composer and, and producer. He, he can use his knowledge and expand that dramatically to understand his audience, the feelings, emotions, and, and continue and add even more value in the value chain. And how can someone take over and distribute that knowledge? Mm -hmm. So he, I think he is in the right position. That's very good. Uh, I, I think that we don't have much time, and I know that there's a lot of interest from our community about artificial intelligence. And I think it's um, fair that we could say that this is not a one-off when it comes to a collaboration on artificial intelligence. This is something that we will continue also with EXA, having a dialogue yeah, on. It's a start. Yes, so this is a start. But I would like to invite uh, already now the audience to ask uh, Lars uh, questions yeah. regarding artificial intelligence and probably then how that can be used in our community. We have a question already. Yeah, anything uh, challenging, please. <laughs> It's great if you tell us who you are. Um, hello, my name is Alex. I'm from Germany. I'm a part of Valso, the Songwriters Alliance under the roof of the DKV. And uh, my question is, um, when AI is coming into the creative process, uh, what is your plan um, how to sell the product to the artists? They are, um, examples from other industries too. Every time when the AI did a process, there may be a little amount of money to be paid, or, and there are examples for that, uh, the record companies are making, uh, for, there, there's an example in Germany, that a record company signed uh, an AI. Um, so when the AI, like you've said now with the chess, when the uh, AI is working together with the composer, who owns the copyrights? And how do you could make money out of this. When I buy an instrument, I buy, for one, I buy it one time and I own it and I won't give money to anyone else after you, that and while I'm using it. How is it with the AI? Mm, yeah, it's a good, good question and thanks for, for, for asking that. Uh, we, we will never own any copyright. That's the composer's right all the way. We, we don't intend to take anything from the final product or, or music, etc. Uh, but when it comes to using the AI system, which is not about installing some program in a machine, nowadays it's, everything is in the cloud, as, all, uh, as everything else. Uh, IBM software is more or less 100% now on the cloud. And if you don't go over a certain level of usage, if it's not a massive company using AI, it's for free. It's not until it becomes very big that we can discuss uh, on, on, on the bilateral level, how should we maybe share the outcome, the financial outcome of this? But to start with, you can start today using this, using what he did on the screen for free. And we, we, are, we, will, we don't intend to own any copyrights. Just to add to that, and yeah, this is, you're asking one person that could be a collaborator, co counterpart, or whatever, but we will, of course, in EXA also continue the you know, really looking into who would own something composed with artificial intelligence. So that is not a closed uh, issue, definitely. Yeah, and there's that one, when you say it's for free, it sounds t a little bit too good to be true to me. <laughs> the, the thing that I, uh, my, my next thought would be, if you give it to us for free in a situation like this, that, that and, and it would be the logical 
idea for me now that you use then the influence that we have as, crea as creatives on the AI to make it even better, to work better for others, but then you get more powerful out of the work that we are doing personally and your position gets way better too. So still you take maybe, there might be the thought that you take away something from us to give you a better position. Yes, and, and, and this is actually the interesting things with new business models. The, 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 the times of linear value change when someone sells, sells and delivers something to another person and then goes on doesn't work any longer. You have to sit down in every case and build a new business model for every situation. Because, yes, you're right, we, we might learn things from you, we might teach you things through our systems, and then we have to sit down and say, okay, who is contributing with what value? And then we sign some kind of agreement based on that. For example, that could we, we could, without going too far here, I mean, we could negotiate between X and IBM and see what is the common model which is good for EXA and your, your position in, the, in your value chain and good for IBM contributing and getting. So, uh, so, so uh, this is not a standard thing. This is something that you sit down and negotiate and come up with a good solution. And we are extremely flexible. Unlike IBM like 30 years ago, then we have strict contact rules. We don't have that any longer. We work with competitors. We work with Google, with Microsoft which people think are our main competitor. I mean, they are, in many cases, our partners. So we are opening up for everyone to contribute and be collaborators, and we are trying to find the best solution. And of course, we want to earn some money somewhere, but not on everything. Great, thank you. We had a question here in the front. I'm Ralf Weigand. Is it working? Yes. I'm Ralf Weigand, the board of GEMA. Um, First of all, we were very interested to hear that, I didn't think two years or three years ago, SACEM, uh, the French organization where we just had John Noel here, uh, were having a, started a collaboration with, uh, with IBM. And we, I would be interested, how is that going along? Is there uh, any results uh, yet? Or does it work well? And what are you actually working? It sounds very interesting to us as GEMA. And I also wanted to just support uh, Alex. It would be very good for us, for us authors if somebody like a high-tech uh, company like IBM would start to think about how could we help the creatives on this world against the digital age problem that all our content is being used and nobody knows what's happening and everybody tells us there's no way of remunerate us. So I think it would be really good in thinking about how you can use AI in, in crawling, web crawling, and just uh, helping us knowing where our uh, creative uh, uh, products are being used uh, to get some remuneration out of that. Because everybody tells us it's just not possible, we can't give you money for that, that your music is being used, for, ex uh, for example. Right, and thanks for reminding me of remuneration, that word that I forget before. Uh, and about the French product, uh, I only know a little bit about that. I think it's ongoing, but I'll, after this I'll find out more about that because that sounds very interesting. Uh, and on the other question, uh, I would say that, that collaboration and finding new business models here and also find out where in the value chain is the value added and can you follow that chain that is actually a very good example on what AI could be used for, to follow that for contribution from different actors through the final product. And the last question, which I think you Im implicitly asked, uh, the way of doing this is really to, to make a very attractive product or services. I can make an example from a completely other industry, from the elevator industry. That's a Finnish company uh, who used to sell escalators and, and, uh, and elevators. They don't do that any longer. You know, they sell people flow. They don't care about the elevators or escalators. So they're getting paid for the final results. Was it convenient to, to go or be, 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 be uh, drawn from point A to point B? So they're totally different business model, and it doesn't make the components is, is not the key, it's the total result. So that's also very a trend going from products to services, or from in this case, 
from things that you get paid for a CD, for example, to an experience and get feedback from the audience with AI systems. So I think we, there is tremendous possibilities of working with this business model in this industry. Very exciting. And I'm very glad that we will continue the dialogue. I'm very glad that we will meet your friend, Pepper, yep. uh, in, after the Creators the, Conference. The AI robot and I think help. that we, uh, do we have time for one more question? So a very short question, if you have. Is it Patrick over here? In the middle? Short, okay. That, that's a big topic. I mean, certainly I think that, uh, and we probably all know this, the uh, main investment with AI is with governments and military, right? That's really what drives them most of all for us composers. We can't help being pessimistic, at least it's my feeling, knowing big corporate conglomerates that you know, control music and the distribution of music, uh, and, and knowing that as soon as they'll be able to use those systems and entirely replace us, I don't have any um, doubt, that they will do, doubt that they will do so. So um, it's a question, it's like a remark. I, I'm, I'm very worried because every day we have proof that the people that are in control um, don't hesitate to take us out of the, the equation. So my reflection is also us composers that are conforming very often into certain styles, you know, the flavor of the day and you have to have a certain piece of music with a certain form. I think the more we do this and the less chances we have actually to compete against AI because the more original we are, it's possibly a way for us to differentiate with ourselves with what's coming. With you no, know, it's it's here. I think it's here. So, I, an ethical question is: How do you stop big corporations from taking over using AI and cut, cutting us out, out of the deal? Uh, I, I don't think that we should try to stop them by legislation or, or policy making. Maybe that's uh, contradictory what has been discussed here, but I, I take the chance of doing that anyway. Uh, I tend to be a little bit more positive with, uh, than you and maybe also slightly disagree with you because I think in the best of worlds, of course I'm an optimist here, uh, but I, I, I value quality much more than quantity. Uh, if you just move, as I said before, information around, if you're just a distribu distributor, that's not a sustainable model, I would say. It's about creating interesting things that people really want to listen to, that is new, that is original. So falling into that trap of being conforming to what's around it's a very dangerous route for the total culture and music sector, I would say. So I'm still hopeful that with or without, but also with AI systems, we should really promote quant quality before quantity here and, and uh, make sure that we are better than the distributors because they are only moving music around and that's not the value that you really should deliver in the value chain. Thank you for those words, Lars, and I think we will, should give Lars a big round of applause. And thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So we'll come to a more technical discussion now. Uh, it's about the value gap. And uh, we'll have uh, Helene Lindvall from the UK, respectively Sweden, from, uh, um, to moderate this panel. She's songwriter and director of the board of the Ivers Academy for Music. And together with her, I would like to welcome also the speakers of the panel. So please come on stage. Yes, hi. That was a really interesting discussion. It's, uh, 
technology and value, it's a, we keep getting back to value, um, how to extract value for creators. Um, and um, as uh, Alicia said, I'm, uh, my name is Helene. I'm a songwriter. Um, I am based in the UK. I have to say before we even start that um, I'm incredibly sad of what's happened. Uh, and I feel it's really European being here, and I'm you know, really grateful that we still get to be part of, of this discussion. And um, uh, we're going to um, discuss uh, the uh, copyright directive um, and where, where, we are, where we were last year, where we are right now, and where we're going. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, Helga Tupel. Um, you were, like, about a year ago, um, we were uh, just, like, hanging in the balance. Um, we've been so kind of let down as music creators so many times that we thought, oh, there's no way this is ever going to go through. The big corporations in, in America have such big lobbying power. Um, and then we, we were completely shocked that, uh, that actually the EU um, uh, came through for us. What, could you um, uh, talk us through what happened since you were right there in the midst of it? You got your microphone there. Thank you, Helene, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I have um, to give you a little bit the background why I was so committed to this copyright reform, because for a lot of people, especially young people all over Europe, it sounded very strange that I was so outspoken on that. And um, I want to start with an article in the New York Times today by George Soros under the title, Zuckerberg should not be in control of Facebook. Because he said the two gentlemen had a meeting last autumn where they obviously find an agreement that the political ads at Facebook are not regulated in any way, and Soros now is very much concerned that the nut regulation will lead to the new election of Trump. And he thinks that is very dangerous, not only because of Trump, but because of the mechanism on this social platform and the lack of regulation. So that was, for me, after the whole debate on ACTA, you remember what happened, and there was a majority in the European Parliament against ACTA, and a lot of young people were very much amused. And my impression was that um, over the last two decades, the nature and character of the Internet has changed dramatically. You know, in the beginning, it was the hippie happy Internet. A lot of young people were very much in favor, and their notion was that all the good things of democracy, enjoying freedoms all over globally, would uh, make our globe a wonderful world. Now we know that this notion of hippie happy internet was not true. We have now a method that means the winner takes it all. We have new monopolies in Silicon Valley. We have very successful business models, which means you take content of other people put ads on it, all the money goes into your own pockets, and you don't share with the authors, the creators, the artists. It's a very successful uh, business model, and a lot of users like it very much because they get a lot of content for free. The notion of freedom of Silicon Valley, and I take it um, as a picture, is a very much neoliberal freedom without any regulation from politics and society. From my point of view, um, that's not a good notion of freedom, because freedom always has to be mixed with responsibility and good rules. You know, we do it in a lot of other things with the market. We have social standards, we hopefully will have more and more ecological standards, we have labor rights, all that stuff, but so far, we don't have it for the digital platforms. We already had it. There is no good taxation. Uh, we d so far, we did not fix the problem with hate speech. And um, de facto, they always argued, and that's still the case with Facebook and Google, that they are only neutral access providers. To a certain extent, they are, but that is not the whole picture. De facto, they are now content providers. 
and they must be responsible for what they do. Shoros' argument vis-a-vis -vis Facebook is now de facto they are a publisher. And publishers have a lot of duties. They have rights, but they have duties. And we as a society, we have to understand what happened with the development of the internet. We all enjoy the freedoms and the possibilities, no question about that. But the internet is not neutral. It's a big amplifier. It amplifies the good things, but the bad things as well. And I think we have to understand that that is the case. It's not only about enjoying wonderful freedoms. It's about the question how we as societies um, try uh, to have good rules for this digital market. And my impression is so far we don't have it. So now I come to the copyright reform where I was so eager fighting for it because the copyright reform for me is part of the whole picture. What do we do? with this, from my point of view, wrong notion of neoliberal freedom of the uh, digital platforms and monopolies. And de facto, they are now monopolies. And therefore, I think if we want to bring them back into society and to give the power of the internet back to the people, we need good rules. And that is a question of European sovereignty and whether the EU is able to deliver for the European citizens and hopefully then for citizens in other parts of the world. Because from my point of view, what we have at the moment, and now I come to the creators, it's just not fair. All the people in the parliament and in the nation states at the moment said, and we heard it this afternoon, of course, artists have to be paid. But very often they don't answer the question, how? And with the copyright reform, they said, yeah, 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 we are in favor of paying the artists, but not like this. But there was no answer how they would do it. We had a pirate answer 10 years ago that was, we flatter them. But it did not work out. Maybe you remember, huh? because it was a, uh, people could decide on their own that what they would like to spend uh, for the artists on the internet, and it was never sufficient. It, it's a very idealistic uh, model huh? to just have um, rules in society only by flattering artists. And because I'm not convinced of that, I think this copyright reform, and there's no obligation to license, but there is an incentive to license by uh, having um, negotiation talks between the platforms, the rights holders, the collective management organizations who have a lot of data, what is going on, and all the collecting uh, societies, the big ones, have the digital means, SASEM and GEMA and all the others, and they should do licensing agreements with the monopolies. That would mean that the platforms have legal certainty, the users have legal certainty, what they don't have at the moment, and the artists would be paid. So from my point of view, that is a good model. And it's not about censorship. It's about the readiness to take action after two decades seeing what is going on with this data systems uh, in the monopolies. And therefore, I know um, we won it in the parliament in the last vote by 76 votes, but we did not win it in society. We have still a lot of people who are very much uh, concerned that this copyright reform would lead uh, to the abolishment of their freedoms, of their behavior on the internet. From my point of view, they are mistaken because there is a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift, what we did already with the Audiovisual Media Service Directive is that we distinguish neutral platforms, access providers from de facto content providers, from active platforms who moderate content and make money with the content of other people which they don't own the rights. And that we want to regulate. And for me, that is a very smart way of answering a lot of questions. It's about fairness in the market. It's about sovereign, sovereignty of Europe. And it's about legal certainty for users so that they are not put to court because they use the internet as they want. And to make the platforms, the richest companies we have at the moment globally, responsible for what they do. And I think it's, a, it's just a good model. Thank you. And a, and a, a, a quick follow-up to that. So do you think that the uh, copyright directive, the way that, that it was passed, that that has the possibility of doing that? 
or because no. it was yeah, now watered it down, obviously, to a certain degree. Yeah, you know, European lawmaking is always uh, about finding compromises, and as you know, it was so heavily disputed. Especially in Germany, we had big manifestations in the streets, a lot of young people saying, that is about censorship, we cannot do on the internet what we want to do anymore. And it was really hard stuff to convince European deputies that it's a good law, a good directive, and now it has to be implemented in the national laws. Now already the same fight starts. And from my point of view, it's a certain sort of cultural war. Which narrative do we follow? Is it an unregulated freedom or are we in favor of a uh, very well-regulated freedom? And um, it's a generation gap because, you know, all the digital natives, for good reasons, uh, they want to keep their internet as they know it. That was their slogan in the big fight. And other people like me, um, we, I want to have a good market regulation like I want in other parts of our societies and political life as well. And that is not finally decided. But now we are a step ahead because we have this law, it has to be implemented. But I think it will be difficult because the same fight we had on the European level last year will start uh, on the national level again. And therefore, for me to talk about the narratives we have, of course, always we have to talk about the details and the paragraphs of the directive. But for me, it's very much about political philosophy, what we want to see um, as uh, politics in the European Union. And because for me, it's part of the whole picture, how we deal with cultural digital capitalism. For me, this uh, reform is so crucial and I try to explain it why I was behind that. Um, and that, from my point of view, it's really a good move. Thank you. So we're going to continue to see how it is actually being implemented. And um, the country that has been in the forefront of implementing the director has been France. So uh, Sarah Jacquier, um, who was very... Um, who was uh, working within the EU w on copyright. Have you... Try to have you tried to have it? Sorry about that. There we go. Um, uh, with the copyright directive, who's uh, now uh, with the French Ministry of Culture, can tell us a bit about how it's going over in France. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it is true that Article 17 is very important for us in France. We've been very much. Uh, invested in negotiation that was really a priority for us in the in the copyright directive among other priorities but clearly we have invested a lot um, I cannot tell you already about the implementation because we have not implemented article 17 yet but it is true that we have a bill right now that is before the Parliament and uh, in which we do implement article 17 um, Achieving a political agreement on Article 17 was a huge achievement. It was very difficult. And it is true that, um, you know, there is still some work ahead. I mean, of course, because we need to, to implement the text in a meaningful manner and uh, all the stakeholders have to work together so that it has concrete impact, you know. So now that we have it, we have to make it work, clearly. And it will be a job and a responsibility for all of us in order to achieve that. So we have to make a difference. Um, how can we make a difference? Uh, when we have consulted the stakeholders in France and uh, think of what to put in the, in the bill, we clearly, we've tried to stay as close as possible to the text, which is already very detailed, you know, it's because it is the result of a political agreement, but that's at the same time trying to to add some clarity in the text where we thought uh, some clarity was needed, at least stakeholders told us. So to make the word text, to have an impact, you have to have a clear legal basis, you have to clear, clear legislation, otherwise people say you have this text but you don't understand. So two examples, you know that Article 17 applies to services that uh, store a large amount of content uploaded by the users. And many people came to us and said, well, large amount of content, I don't know what it means. 
I don't know what it means, and I don't want to wait until the last minute before I go to the court and to see what it means. So, but at the same time, it is true that uh, this concept that is vague uh, leaves some flexibility because, um, you know, the important thing is that the platform has an impact on the market, and the impact can depend depending on the sectors. Maybe you need more amount of content to have an impact on the music sector and less amount in the audiovisual sector. So you need flexibility, but at the same time, you need clarity. And I think that's something we are struggling with the implementation of Article 17, is keeping the flexibility that is needed for the text and having clarity for the stakeholders. So that, that's something really important. The second example I want to give is the concept of best efforts. That is key and it's really the, the, the key concept in the text. Um, in our perspective, it is a very high standard, best effort. It's really that you have to do all, you know, that it is reasonable and, you know, taking into account um, the state of the art and the best practices. Um, so this is the kind of objective we are looking for. Um, but at the same time, um, clearly, the text insists, and it is well done, on the proportionality. So best efforts can vary depending on the sectors, the types of s the services, and, uh, and the types of content that are involved. And that's very important. That's a key for the balance of the text. But hang on. Best e it doesn't mean that it has to be status quo. Okay? I see best effort as like a dynamic uh, obligation constraint. So, you know, the, the idea is always to go uh, towards uh, more efficient technologies. So that, that's clearly one thing. So, um, so but yeah. Can you legislate with that? Like uh, what best efforts are or how, how do you actually? So uh, exactly. So that's, well, first, the first step is to know about what are the current practices, difficulties, concrete examples. So this is basically the work that is being done at the commission level with the stakeholders dialogue. And Marco will uh, detail on that. But in France or also on our side, and I think because um, you know, I believe in collective intelligence, and so the more data we have, the better we are. So we've commissioned at the Ministry of Culture a, a report uh, made by a council that is usually regularly advises the Ministry of Culture on different uh, copyright-related issues, but also ADOPI, which is the public agency in charge of fighting against piracy. So these people have worked like for six months, consulted a lot, and they've made a report that is that, that size and that can share with you because it has been publicly available. And they give an overview of the kind of technologies that can be used by platforms and um, you know whether they are available in each sector, whether platforms implement them or not, uh, what are the challenges for the implementation of this technology, da, da, da. So that's give us a, a, a first thing. You know, so that's a, that's a view, that's an overview. Then we have, of course, the dialogue um, conducted by the commission. And legally speaking, in our bill, we are entrusting uh, the public agency ARCOM, ARCOM, which is, will be a new regulator in France, uh, that will be the result of a merger between our audiovisual regulator today, called the CSA, and ADOPI, the agency in charge of uh, fighting against piracy. So we'll have ARCOM that will give some recommendations um, uh, on uh, what uh, you know, best efforts could be, and uh, we'll assess uh, the effectiveness of these technologies. And so that, that will give, again, that will give more clarity. That doesn't mean that, you know, still you will have to comply with the requirement and the directive that there is a case-by-case -case assessment and that there is no magic solution for every kind of platform because, again, you have to come back to this proportionality test and the fact that it has to be a case-by-case -case assessment. But knowing better, because, you know, we are in a, in a, in a field where there is, and this is classic in the platform environment, in a field where there is an asymmetry of information between rights holders and the platforms. So basically, it's a building a common ground, uh, a common knowledge, so that rights holders and platforms can work better. And the last thing that I would like to, um, to raise is, uh, and I think this is uh, what Elga Trooper was uh, touching on, is that 
it's the importance of keeping the balance of the text over the implementation. And uh, as part of the compromise, uh, a lot has been given to the users, and we think it's crucial. So, you know, the users, because they will have to benefit from the exceptions to copyrights, and in particular the right the ones made mandatory by the directive, which is quotation and, uh, and so on. And they will have to benefit from an efficient redress mechanism. Um, and, um, and, and, so th and, and, that, and that's very key to us, clearly. I mean, if we want Article 17 to deliver some results that will build the copyright legitimacy over time, we need to keep the balance correct. Thank you. Okay. And now we're going to move, and I, I think this is one of the reasons why I've been uh, roped in to moderate here, because I'm the only one that can uh, pronounce his name, Torbjörn Öström, um, <laughs> who uh, is with STIM in Sweden. Um, so Sweden being, you know, the, the basically the, the, the birthplace of piracy, um, uh <laughs> nothing to be proud of there, um, but... Um, the birthplace of piracy, but also the birthplace of, of like the first kind of real legal streaming service. Um, uh, what, uh, how, how does it look in Sweden? Are people kind of turning to, to uh, you know, warming to the idea of the copyright directive? Um, is it, are you finding that there's any um, uh, difficulties in, in kind of even getting convincing people even now before you're, you get the implementation? Well, you is it working? Yeah, yeah. it's on. Well, I think uh, we had a, a pretty special uh, run in Sweden uh, when it, in relation to the, the copyright directive and Article 17 especially. And, and uh, you may or may not know that Sweden changed their standpoint at the last minute and voted no to the directive. And this was due to um, the Swedish parliament forcing the government to vote no. And in that process, even one of the parties of the Swedish government voted against its own government. And that is something that is totally unique in Swedish political history. So you can imagine that what the, the level of debating uh, was quite high then. However, th I, I think that that was evident that that was had a lot to do with the upcoming elections for the European Parliament. So, basically, the day at the ele elections, I think the discussion publicly kind of died. So now we're in a in a position there. I don't think we talk about copyright all that much for now. Perhaps that will change uh, in, in some months. But at the moment, in the transposition process. Uh, we are focusing pretty much on the technical issues and uh, with some peace and quiet actually. Uh, and there are quite a few technical issues as well, so we are quite happy that we are able to discuss them without having uh, public opinion to, to discuss it with. And what are the, uh, the technical issues without getting too kind of bogged down? Is it well, kind of. Well, well, to say like this, the, the, the method of working that the, the Minister of Justice in Sweden have, have chosen is to uh, hand out memos uh, on different parts of the directive. And the memo, the questionnaire or the question memo relating to Article 17, or the first half of Article 17, was actually 32 pages, I think. So there are quite a lot of, of issues. Uh, that they would like to discuss. And I think that is also in order to get the legislation that everyone can, can accept. Uh, so there are quite a lot of stakeholders. I think there are 100 stakeholders at every meeting. And they're trying to get uh, an, uh, a process where you have to give your answers in writing, just to force the stakeholders to, to step up a little bit and actually tell them what they want. So I think it's a good way of, of uh, handling the transposition and the political uh, context. Do you find that there, there's more, uh, th that, that people are willing to get into a conversation of, of trying to come up with solutions and, and not just uh, protest, uh, continue protesting against the, uh, the uh, uh, directive that has already been, been passed? Well, I, I think there's quite a lot of the stakeholders that were pretty loud uh, are, 
are sort of dropping out of the process now uh, when it gets to the nitty-gritty of the legislation because now it's, I mean, we have the decision and, and it's it's to make as good as legislation as possible. So it's, it's I think it, it demands more of the stakeholders to, to come and be creative actually than just just uh, having uh, slogans. Yeah. Right. And and now we're going to move to uh, Marco Giorello, uh, who's going to uh, be able to give us uh, a bit more of a broader, since you're with DG Connect and and the uh, uh, European Commission, um, you have a bit of an overview of what's going on uh, regarding implementation. We've got France that seem to be kind of moving quite, you know, quite well forward, then we have Poland where there are issues um, and, and court cases. Um, could you give us a, a kind of a, a, a gist of the what's going on? Yes, sure, and uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, <clears throat> in reaction, uh, actually, you know, to, to the previous interventions, uh, I, I really think uh, you know, we should be proud of what we have done with Article 17, and thanks again, uh, you know, to Helga Truppel and all those who helped us in the Parliament, to the French government and those who helped us uh, in in the Council. Uh, uh, yes, th 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 thanks for that, and uh, uh, because it has been a uh, Herculean task, I think, frankly it would have been very difficult to do better. I think uh, the article, uh, as it is in the end, uh, obviously, you know, things can always be better, but it is in a quite good shape. I think, uh, you know, quite miraculously, I would say, because uh, really considering all uh, the pressure that we have done, also from a technical point of view, I think in the end, uh, you know, it makes sense, <laughs> if I may say as a, as, a, as a lawyer. So really, let's be proud of that and, and keep working on, uh, on that. Now, uh, the, the second thing I wanted to comment on, and this again, I mean, what Helga Truppel said at the beginning, uh, I think, uh, you know, I would summarize it as, uh, you know, uh, th this directive brings copyright into market regulation issues to some extent, and I think it's something very important that I want to stress. It's not the first time that I'm doing so. Since the beginning, in the Commission original proposal, uh, there was the ambition to try to bring more fairness in the copyright environment, uh, in the digital environment in particular. This is not only Article 17, it's also Article 15, the publishers. It is the part on creator's remuneration, which uh, we'll be discussing in the next panel. And I think, uh, you know, this uh, really moves copyright legislation at European level uh, into new territories in terms of market regulation and the attempt to address imbalances uh, in the value chain, which is something, again, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that I always like to, uh, to stress. Now, where are we? You ask me, you know, uh, you know quite, uh, quite, quite, quite relevant, uh, uh, of course. Where are we with implementation uh, uh, at any moment? I think overall... Uh, uh, it's still early days. I mean, a lot of discussions are uh, ongoing, but uh, on Article 17 in particular, if I'm not wrong, uh, we have seen only two drafts, uh, and only the French uh, draft law is already before a national parliament. The other one is the Dutch uh, draft, uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, it's still, uh, you know, going back and forth between, <laughs> you know, different uh, departments uh, in the government, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll probably go soon, actually, to the Council of Ministers. But uh, so it's, it's really early. Uh, we are having uh, uh, regular discussions, not only with stakeholders, and I will come back to the stakeholder dialogue in a moment, but also with member states. Uh, as many of you in the room know, we have uh, a committee, which is uh, the Copyright Contract Committee, which gathers quite regularly with member states, uh, and Sara is one of the colleagues coming from the capitals uh, to discuss uh, uh, different areas of the directive. But uh, overall, uh, apart the couple of examples that I mentioned, uh, most member states uh, are really still uh, at the stage of uh, stakeholder consultations, like in Sweden, for example, or uh, internal, uh, you know, discussions uh, within uh, within uh, the administration. I think uh, a lot more will happen 
in the coming months. So I think really 2020 is clearly going to be the key year, actually, for, uh, for the implementation. But it's very early, you know, to give you trend or tendencies, uh, uh, you know, uh, and in particular on Article 17. This brings me to what the Commission is doing at the moment, uh, uh, which is the stakeholder dialogue, but also, uh, you know, the preparation of uh, guidance on this article. Uh, I think that, uh, to, to, to some extent, uh, you know, we will, uh, and I think it's quite natural uh, to some extent, uh, have to take responsibilities at European level, actually, to try to bring more clarity in uh, all of this dilemma between flexibility and clarity that, uh, that Sarah was mentioning. So definitely the Commission guidelines are going to be an important document, but I would even say more than the document, I think it would be an important process in the coming month because we will have to try, basically, to bring uh, as much as possible uh, let's even say it, consensus. I think consensus in this area is difficult, but at least uh, clarity and engagement of different stakeholders you know, before coming up uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a guidance document. Uh, and in a way, in this perspective, uh, okay, let, let, let's see you know, how far the French law will develop. Uh, uh, in an event, as Sarah mentioned, this is a quite faithful, uh, let's say, reproduction, if I may, of Article 17, but uh, generally, I, I don't think it's worrying uh, that the member states have not passed the legislation on that yet, because to some extent I think it's, it's, it's not bad uh, if you know, we, we bring the European level discussion a bit further, we come up uh, with guidance at European level, uh, and I think uh, if, we are, if, if we manage to do it fast enough, uh, this will be important for everybody also at the national level somehow to have uh, a consistent and coordinated approach. Of course, it's, it's not going to be easy, basically, but is what we're trying to do. Uh, now, I mean, I, I think maybe I leave the details on the stakeholder dialogue for a follow-up question that you may want to ask me. Uh, I think generally, uh, you know, uh, we are really trying since the beginning to prepare this guidance uh, uh, being uh, as inclusive as possible. And, uh, uh, if, you know, those of you closer to the subject uh, will have noticed that uh, we published a call for interest, actually, to invite stakeholders to participate to the stakeholder dialogue. We had uh, six meetings of the stakeholder dialogue, five so far. We will have more. Uh, we have uh, more or less 120 people in the room uh, representing uh, very different in interests, including, you know, those who are very strongly against Article 17, but we will we believe that it's important to have everybody in the same room. In the end, obviously, it will be for the Commission, you know, to try, you know, to draw conclusions from that, and it's not an easy task, but uh, really inclusiveness of the process, I think, is very important for the legitimacy of, uh, you know, whatever we're going to write, uh, in particular because of the history of uh, this discussion, which uh, we all know has been particularly, uh, parti particularly difficult. Um, so I think this is a little bit the scene setter. Uh, then, you know, of course, uh, you know, the more we continue, the more we will have detailed uh, discussions on uh, different aspects. And obviously, the point that Sarah raised are among the most difficult where we will need to see how, how, how detailed uh, we, can, uh, we can be. So, because um, it was, uh, there's been a bit of worry sometimes that there, maybe people are dragging their their feet, or uh, certain countries are dragging their feet, waiting for what other countries are doing, or or when there's a court case in one country, to wait to see what how that kind of plays out in order to to uh, kind of uh, look at that before they do their own implementation. Is that a a, a, a worry that is legitimate or what do you think? I think we are largely past that uh, in the sense that, uh, broadly speaking, I think now there is a clear obligation in legislation to implement the directive, and frankly, I think everybody is uh, playing along, uh, you know, in national governments. Then, of course, I mean, we still have one year and a half before the deadline, so it's a bit early to say, but uh, the discussion that we are having, at least at technical level, uh, you know, with member states, uh, are constructive discussions, basically. You know, I don't see anybody, you know, trying to do opposition. Of course, it was, you know, at the time a very political and very visible file. So what happened happened also in terms of uh, statements at political level. But uh, I think now we are largely past uh, uh, that. Um, 
Sweden is a good example in this respect because, I mean, I think, you know, as you explained very well, uh, of course, there was the government, uh, there was the parliament, uh, so, you know, it was not, uh, not easy. In the end, the, 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 the government uh, voted against, but uh, I see uh, that the Swedish government is very much engaged uh, really now into, into the technical work, and uh, I would even say it's probably one of the most engaged country at the moment in uh, really trying to do a good preparatory work at technical level. Then, of course, I mean, let's see in one year uh, uh, where all this brings us, uh, but uh, overall, uh, I, think, uh, I think, you know, the temperature went down a lot, uh, and now everybody is, uh, is playing ball uh, uh, for, uh, for the implementation. So, and then th this question kind of goes to everybody, and I, I can't kind of like not ask this question living in the UK and, uh, you know, we, we were just informed last week that, that um, apparently uh, the UK is not going to implement the copyright directive now that it's pulled out uh, of the EU. Um, what kind of effect do you see that the uh, Brexit and, and uh, Britain uh, leaving the EU will have on... on uh, the implementation of this, will it have any effect? I, I mean, in the sense, of obviously, it still has to be implemented, but what, what would be the uh, uh, effectiveness of it? Um, obviously, is a big part of, of um, Europe that will possibly now not implement it. Um, anybody want to uh, comment on, on that? <laughs> Don't all jump up, up at once. But I start. Um, so the other countries, the 27 uh, who are still in the European Union, um, they are obliged to implement it. That's the difference to the UK now. I was um, reasoning why the UK behaved like that. My very bad interpretation, but it can be that I'm mistaken, was that Johnson, because of the free trade agreement with Trump, what he wants is now very um, cautious and uh, tries not to interfere this free trade notion by doing this copyright, what means uh, regulation. Um, I don't know whether that is, I'm very interested to hear um, tonight what is your assessment of the situation. And I think what is true, what we heard, um, the temperature went down after the final vote uh, in the parliament. But um, I think at least what I see in Germany, um, now they only made proposals, the Ministry for Justice, for the ancillary copyright and the publisher's right, and not for Article 17. You know, you see, uh, they are very hesitant, they have a very difficult situation uh, in the government with now the new leadership, uh, at least the, the woman very outspoken against Article 17 and the so-called upload filters. So they, uh, I think, at least in my uh, home country, we need a lot of um, argumentation to convince people what is the reason behind uh, this directive, because it's not done. There are still a lot of people on Twitter and the internet who are very much afraid, and they still argue the whole reform will lead to censorship and the end of freedom. And if it's considered like this, of course, um, a lot of people are against because they are in favor of freedom of expression, what I am as well. And I don't consider it to be censorship, and I think it will not uh, lead to that. But as long as people are afraid that that could be the outcome, we have a big political problem. And therefore, I think it's very, very important uh, to argue in the press, uh, in uh, your friendship groups, on the net, uh, in uh, newspapers, in television, because a lot of people, from my point of view, are really mistaken what this law is about. And you have to make them understand why it's about a level playing field, why it's about fairness, and we have to make it positive. The connotation has to be a different one. And we have the camps still out there who make it a, a very negative thing. And from my point of view, it's, as I already said, it's not a negative thing, but very much the other way around. But we have to make the people understand. Otherwise, we cannot win it. So I mean, the, uh, speaking of that, the, the issue seems to be with the content uh, recognition technology. Um, if that is, is actually censorship technology or if it's simply to, to recognize uh, what is being uploaded. How do you kind of 
get past that in the uh, in the discussion in the stakeholder discussions. Actually, we are we are having a meeting in ten days <laughs> where we will go into this big time. Uh, I think uh, you know as. As also Sarah was saying, uh, first of all, uh, there is uh, a proportionality test which applies pretty much throughout the entire article. So, you know, also, you know, different technology may be a best effort in different situations and, you know, we need uh, to cover more ground basically to see this. And then there is a fundamental issue, which is, uh, frankly, one of the most difficult things, actually, that we will have to address. Uh, and indeed, the next meeting will be crucial in this respect, but uh, the discussion will continue, uh, I, I think, for, for a few more months, probably, before we are able uh, to, to issue the guidance, which is uh, how to make sure that the application of technology in response to the best effort obligation is done in such a way to respect uh, you know, freedom of expression of the users. And uh, there are a lot of check and balances in the directive. Uh, I think uh, you know, it's quite a beautiful construction from uh, you know, <laughs> a legal and intellectual point of view, but uh, the practicalities actually will be quite uh, you know, challenging to define. And I think is, uh, is one of the key issues there, but definitely I think that we have all the tools in the directive actually to make sure that uh, uh, there is a balanced application of, uh, of, the, of the new regime. And definitely, I mean, I don't think anybody had uh, you know, any desire to impose a censorship <laughs> on the users. We are far from that, actually. This was uh, the political discussion. But, but there is an important angle of freedom of expression that, that, that comes from the proportionality and from all these mechanisms, and we need, uh, we need to go into details about this, and we will see how to do that. Sarah, you wanted to come on? Yes, just on consent recognition technologies, uh, we believe that there has been a, a big misunderstanding because, I mean, these technologies have been developed by big platforms for years. Uh, in 2007, you have the UGC principles already, and uh, so they have been implemented but they have been implemented uh, in a discretionary manner by platforms and with the transparency level they wanted to give. So uh, basically now the idea is to promote the use of technology when that makes sense, and we hopefully it will make sense more and more. Um, but again, taking into account the proportionality test, uh, but at the same time with giving more, you know, a framework to the use of these technologies and basically rights for the user that I didn't have or, you know, because in the US, uh, in the DMCA, the US legislation, for example, the user had the right to complain, which is not the case in the EU system right now. So it's basically, yes, these technologies have always, you know, have existed for years. Now we're injecting more transparency and balance and also it's not like a la carte, you know, it's all the, all the rights holders that will be entitled to use them, you know, to have access to them, which is not the case today. So, again, because it is a discretionary tool used by platforms. So, yeah. So, I think there has been a big misunderstanding, and I hope that uh, working all together, taking into account the checks and balances that are in the directive, as Marco said, uh, I think will, you know, convince that we are moving to another era where, you know, it can work for everybody. And speaking of uh, content technology, since you're, uh, Tobian, yep. since you're um, uh, working in the uh, kind of tech on the technological side of this, um, have, what's the uh, response been in Sweden uh, with the... Uh no, but I think that it's the same arguments uh, in Sweden as in, in, uh, in other countries. Uh, Exactly the same, basically, that uh, this is something new and this is, uh, well, you know, the end of internet and so on and so forth. But uh, I, now I think that, that in the, in the uh, uh, transposition process, of course, this is very single out as being super important to, to balance those interests. And, of course, the Swedish government follows the, the stakeholder dialogues uh, as well very, very closely. So we're, we're actually on hold on deciding uh, until the stakeholder dialogues are, are uh, finished. And I think that is uh, quite a good, good way of handling it, uh, especially in, if you will have an uh, internal market that will be uh, well-functioning. Um. So the 
Helga, you mentioned the, you know, obviously the, the U.S. companies, uh, you know, with the dominance of U U.S. companies and when it comes to these platforms. And I, I wanted to ask you, what do you think that, that um, I mean, with that dominance, with that, will that affect how this is going to be implemented in the end? Because obviously, like the way that was mentioned bef in, a, in a previous panel, you know, the internet is, doesn't have borders. Um, and even though, you know, we uh, we can have implementation on a local level, it will always be affected in some way or other by platforms that are based in other constituencies. Yeah, but they operate on European soil according uh, to European laws. Uh, that, uh, that is a crucial point and it depends very much on us what we regulate and what, uh, how we want them to behave. And we had it with the um, data reform, you know, the US was very much against and the big uh, companies were uh, lobbying heavily against uh, the data reform. But now they uh, uh, start to argue in the US that they maybe would need it as well. So therefore, I think we, at first we have to concentrate on what we politically want uh, in the European Union. And of course, their lobbying is heavy early, and we know at the moment that Google still is going around and say, oh, we don't want it like this, and it does not work, and all that stuff about. Last year, I was with part of the Cultural Committee in Silicon Valley in September, after the first vote and summer before the end vote. And it was very clear that um, the companies who do a license, like Netflix, they, and Apple, they were very much in favor of this reform because they said that's a good business model and uh, we don't want <coughs> to be as dirty as YouTube and Facebook. And then we were with um, YouTube and uh, Facebook, Google, and the copyright lawyer said, yes, we will interfere in the negotiations in the European Council. We want to stop this reform. And they said, oh, good to know and that you are so bold on that. And we will try to do the utmost to make our reform happen. And of course, they are heavy lobbyists. They have very well-paid lawyers. Don't underestimate them. But I think we have good lawyers as well. We have very good politicians, and we have a clear vision what we want to achieve in terms of fairness and justice on the internet. And um, yes, we have to um, be ready to fight that. That is my um, approach. I just wanted to add, uh, <clears throat> you know, a few words on the international dimension that uh, uh, definitely, I mean, this directive is uh, setting the scene uh, also for other countries, basically, and other industrialized countries actually to look at the issue. I mean, uh, I, I can uh, say that uh, from our side, you know, being uh, sitting in the commission office, we are getting... Uh, many more questions about how the new directive and Article 17, among other things, work from uh, the US government, the Canadian government, the Japanese government. Now, I mean, I don't know to what extent everybody will follow exactly the same thing, but definitely is really one of these areas, and data protection and the GDPR was probably the other good example, where we have managed as Europe, basically, you know, to take leadership at international level with something brave, something new, and, and, and I think this will have an influence, you know, also outside, uh, outside the Europe, uh, which may also be, you know, a tiny bit of a beginning of a reply to your question about the UK, but that, <laughs> that's to be seen. Fingers <laughs> crossed, yeah. Um, I wanted to open up for questions from our audience. Um, do we have any questions for our distinguished panelists? Usually, it's like all we need is like one question, then people start uh, warming up, and oh, we got two of them. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll start with uh, Emmanuel. Thank you, Helian. Uh, Emmanuel Legrand. Uh, are they, are we going to see unintended consequences uh, with the implementation of the law as? Uh, YouTube's chief executive uh, seemed to have implied that the, the, the law in itself will lead to unintended consequences, and if so, which one will there be? Good question. <laughs> Anybody want to address that one? So um, maybe <coughs> we have to, to see clearly that we already have upload filters. We have it with, uh, uh, um, with Google and Facebook, 
And so far, nobody more or less has any sort of influence on how they use upload filters. They do it with terrorist posts and they do it with um, nakedness. Huh? We don't have the same rules in Europe, but they have it. And when I argue with the people um, who are their internet activists, my first question to them is when they are so concerned about the unintended consequences, do you agree that we already have upload filters? Sometimes they do agree, mostly they don't agree. But I think it's a clear fact that we have already upload filters. With this law, I always would say we get more influence on what they do and hopefully more transparency about upload filters. And um, then the, there was the argument they would uh, have to monitor everything. I think the law is so intelligent and the paragraph, there is um, a special paragraph in the law that general monitoring is forbidden. But the uh, internet activists always argue with that, that, that it would be the unintended consequence that everything has to be monitored and with that uh, freedom of expression would be abolished. I don't see that because there is a clear definition that only commercial platforms who com do communicate to the public with a huge amount of copyright protected content so that it's not the individual user. It's clear who is addressed and therefore um, I think we have a lot of safeguards. You can go to court now with this law if things uh, go in a direction you don't want. You have mechanisms in the law how people have to come together to negotiate and to clarify things. So I think even if there, and you never can say it would not happen, but if there are things would happen we don't want to see, there are much more mechanisms to get rid of it as we had it before and as we have it so far. Therefore, for me, that is really an improvement. And of course, you never can say there could not be a problem of overblocking, as we had it before with this icon from the Vietnam War. But then there is a lot of possibilities with the courts um, to clarify that and to upload again. Therefore, I think that is the best way what a state with the rule of law can do, to say what we want to see as fairness, and if there are problems, the people can go to court and clarify the things. That is, for me, a sort of... Um, transparency and um, readiness to balance different interests in a state with the rule of law. Marco? Yeah, just, I, I couldn't agree more, absolutely. I think the, the, the point is that, uh, you know, whatever uh, intended or unintended consequences may arise now, we are going to have a clear legal framework, actually, so we are regulating technology that already exists. There is just one thing, actually, that, uh, that, that I want to stress of a risk that uh, may happen. So I think it's good that we are all aware of that. After the directive has been implemented in national legislation, it's going to be easy to blame the directive for any unintended consequences in terms of blocking of uh, legitimate content that is happening, uh, probably big time uh, and maybe even more today than it will happen in the future. But uh, the risk is that uh, everybody who is against uh, this article starts to say, ah, you see, basically, now things are blocked because of this directive. So I think uh, what you said is extremely important. Uh, when we get there, if we get there in one year, two years, uh, remind everybody, guys, uh, these things uh, have been happening for 10 years, uh, but now you know, we have the check and balances and the legal framework uh, to make sure, actually, that uh, things uh, are balanced uh, and, and, and that we get them right. Because otherwise, it's going to be easy, basically, to blame, uh, actually, the directive uh, on situations which have always happened uh, in the past and, I would say, probably are happening even more now that will happen in the future. Well, I mean, speaking of filter, I think that, um, I mean, I just had that the other day. I up uploaded a picture from Carmen, the, the, you know, the uh, classical album um, that had, you know, the, the back of um, a woman in the nude on it, and it got blocked by Facebook because uh, it didn't, you know, and there was no, nowhere I could kind of go and to appeal for, for to have my picture um, stay up there. So, um, you know, there's... Like you said, there's already filters. It's only that it's decided by Facebook and, and not by um, EU law. Um, there was another question down there. I think it's Alexander. Thank you very much. Um, 
repeat who you are. Uh, I'm Alex, I'm from Verso, uh, under the roof of the Deka Frau from Germany. And um, when I discuss these topics with my colleagues and the other composers in Germany, for example, pretty often I have the feeling that we talk about a way too small idea of what we are talking about. Because, um, because our product is immaterial, it was just the first one facing the problems um, in these platform atmospheres. And um, I think it's very important to understand, and I have the feeling you do, uh, but that this is just an example of what we are going to deal with also when we look at other uh, value of ideas or creative work, um, for example, just 3D printing industries, etc. So, um, on the other hand, when I discuss now with uh, people about these topics and uh, I try to convince them, um, uh, it's sometimes hard to uh, prove that this is a good way to go, the well regulation. And the big question is, how can we make something that just feels right? Right now it just feels right. When we sit here and talk about this, it feels right to, to follow that route. But what, what is there to prove it to the people we are talking to that this is the right direction um, to go? Well, I, I guess the market will prove it, uh, uh, or that is my hope, of course, that, uh, for instance, the argument that there would be less content available, uh, my guess and hopes, of course, is that there's no incentives to have less content available. Uh, so within a couple of years, if we can manage to license the content, there's the evidence for, for this being basically wrong. Uh, and I think that this is some, all these problems is market problems, basically. And what we're doing now is, is adjusting a, a dysfunctional market a little bit. And as long as we are, as stakeholders, taking responsibility, and as well as our counterparts, I think the, the, the market will show them wrong. Uh, and I, I think that it's also, when you look at all uh, different markets, not just the creative market, if you, you know, with, uh, Amazon and companies like that, that people are starting to realize that that we need to have some sort of, of um, oversight and, and regulation to, to actually have a functioning market. It's like the creative sector is the, uh, the canary in the coal mine. We can, we can take one more last question. Another musician down there. We got Marcus from Finland. Yeah, hello. I am Marcus from uh, the Finnish Music Creators, and, and uh, one question that popped up, uh, a debate I've also uh, contributed to in, in Finland within Facebook, finally. <coughs> uh, uh, there are some indie labels in Finland who've been very concerned about um, the polarizing effect within the whole music industry and, and uh, there are some people uh, who, and I've even written uh, or read some, some pieces online about the people who were opposed to the, uh, the directive uh, claiming that uh, only the major rights holders will be remunerated and, and basically the small players like a small indie label or a small music creator in Finland won't see a nickel, or at least any more money than than you know we've seen so far. I wonder how can we prevent this from happening? Will the market take care of it? Because the market hasn't really taken care of the small players so far. It's actually gone the opposite direction. Well, I guess it's a you know because it's the rest of the copyright directive. Uh, uh, addresses a lot of those things. Did you want to? Um, no, no. You. I mean, I'm just moderating. No, but 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 uh, we have had a situation, a market situation, where you had uh, somewhat, to a large extent, dysfunctional market, and now you're actually leveling the playing field a little bit. And I think that could only lead to positive effects for for the uh, the small creators or or uh, 
the small companies. Uh, I can't see that this wouldn't improve their situation in the long run. So to, to kind of to finish off with that or kind of follow up on what he was just saying, what can, because there's a, obviously a lot of music creators here as well, um, what can we do? I mean, I, I know that for for one, I, living in the UK, even even though we're not in the EU anymore, what what can we um, what can we do to kind of help uh, bring the, this copyright directive to fruition? In you know across the board, what can we as music creators? I know that we kind of help push it over the line, but it seems like we're still we're still kind of. Uh, we shouldn't just sit back and do nothing, that we, we can still help with this. Yeah, Marco? But I think uh, uh, part of the answer is what we will discuss in the next panel. So there are uh, specific rules on creators, but when it comes to Article 17, I think it's very important that uh, you keep uh, telling us, uh, giving us the perspective of the smaller players overall, which is something that uh, I think the Commission has clear in mind. Uh, uh, that there is not only YouTube uh, and big authors collecting societies, but uh, there is much more to that. Uh, and again, I think that uh, we have the tools in Article 17 to reach out to everybody and making sure that we have a good application of the article in all cases. But I think very concretely, and now we will have a few more months of uh, engagement of stakeholders, discussions about uh, the implementation of this article in the preparation of the guidance, uh, do tell us, do bring the perspective of the smaller ones, because I think this is something that we are very keen to take into account, but it's important basically to come our way, as I said, to avoid that everything is characterized as, uh, you know, a, 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 a duel between uh, very big players, uh, because we know that there is much more, but we needed to have, uh, you know, feedback on this as well. All right. Um, I'm gonna, I want to thank our, our distinguished panel, and uh, can we give them a, a round of applause? And thank you very much. We'll just have a few seconds to change the water, but don't leave the room. We're gonna start in 20 seconds. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're continuing, as I promised you, only a few seconds of uh, break. So, um, if I could have your attention, please. We're going to go on to the third panel, um, where we will discuss exploitation contracts for authors and performers, buyout contracts and or fair remuneration. I'd like to... Um, Welcome Kate Hafnevik on stage. She's composer, songwriter, and artist. And together with her, I would like to, to welcome the speakers who will be introduced by Kate. So give them a, please give them a hand. Thank you so much. Um, I know it's been a long day. Uh, some of us got up very early to uh, travel here. So hopefully we can keep um, your attention for another hour, um, keep focused on important subjects. Please take your seats. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> or actually, time and six starts sitting here. So, nowadays, buyout contracts are very a common practice in the industry. And... Um, 
With these types of contracts, authors and performers sell all their rights for the full duration of the copyright to their cons contractual counterparts. However, buyouts deprive authors and performers of royalties, which we actually depend on because often the fee is so low that the reward is the royalties. So this means um, that a continuous revenue stream from their creations and pro or performance will be removed. So how can in individual creators and performers who are in a weak bargaining position improve this situation? And do national legislators need to provide the solution? Or can collective bargaining with the respective industries generate better outcome for creators? So, let me introduce the, the panel. Uh, we'll start with you, Simon, uh, from the UK. Um, you've been in the music business and uh, you've been writing pop music and you've been scoring uh, film, TV. You've been uh, head of a choir and you've had a wonderful career. I'm sure you've bumped into all sorts of contracts during that time. Um, so I would like to give each of you six minutes first for a, a first opening question. And Simon, so as an uh, audiovisual composer and songwriter, you've often been confronted by bi buyout contracts, right? And uh, can you explain what a buyout is and give some specific examples? I can. Hi, uh, very nice to be here, and thank you, Kate, and thanks to EXA for inviting me to be here. I just want to add to Helien's comment, actually, uh, being a Brit in the room on the stage, I'm so upset about what just happened to us, but I've been very grateful by the reaction that I've had amongst my fellow creators today, uh, that we're, we're still working, and we're looking forward to being part of Europe somehow, so thank you. <clears throat> anyway, to get to back to this, uh, I've, I've prepared some notes on this, so forgive me, I'm going to read them actually to try and be clear. Uh, the practice referred to as a buyout is when a producer, typically in the audiovisual or video game sectors, obtains the rights of the creator in exchange for a one-off fee. The transfer or demand for these rights is all too often a precondition of the uh, commissioning process. In short, if you want to work, you will do so on our terms or take it or leave it. The buyout of the mechanical right has become standard practice in the US and the UK, although you still can get some uh, mechanical rights in the UK if you're lucky, but it's becoming increasingly common here in Europe. More and more, however, we hear of composers who are also being forced to surrender their performing rights. This is also against a background of shrinking fees, which makes the situation intolerable, as I'm sure anyone in this room will know. The trend manifests itself in the most extreme manner at the end of last year, when Discovery Networks US stated, it would require a complete buyout of the performing and mechanical rights in the future, and a waiver of rights for all works previously commissioned by them. Whilst a significant backlash from the creator community forced Discovery to abandon this proposal, it is a clear indication of the direction of travel it left, uh, if left unchecked. Earlier this year, the Ivers Academy held a consultation with its members on the practice of buyouts in the UK. The most striking results of the survey are those which show the true nature of the relationship between producers and creators. For example, 41% of creators said they had been required to give away more of their mecha mechanical rights than they wanted and a further 35% said they had been subject to full buyouts or work for hire commissions in the last five years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Young composers, of course, are the most at risk of being exploited, eager as they are to get work and build their careers. We've all been there. The next generation of composers faced a bleak future, where they no longer own their rights and their works generate no income for them. To be balanced, however, an upfront payment for rights is not always a bad option for a composer. There are instances where such practices are in the best interests of the creator because of the nature of the work or the markets in which they will be used. As an example, I'm in the middle of some work for a Middle Eastern TV company where performing rights are barely recognized. So a good fee and the maintenance of all my rights should there be any further international exploitation was the best deal I could do. And for the record, I've never done a buyout completely in my life. 
Uh, but overwhelmingly, buyouts devalue the, the composer's worth considerably. The key is that it must be the choice of the creator to decide, not for the pr producers to demand. It's the very purpose of copyright, to allow the rights holder the freedom to control the use of their work, their property. The solutions uh, are many, if not easy. We need to ensure the copyright protections around the world actually work in protecting creators and their rights. Equally, the creative community needs to stand together on this issue and say with one voice that we will not work on these terms. I'm pri privileged to have had quite a long career as a songwriter and composer. I've hit, hit, hits with all sorts of people. Buggers, Dollar, Grace Jones, Slave to the Rhythm, Toya, Cliff Richard. And I've composed a lot of TV music, which is where I've encountered the buyouts more. Uh, programs such as BBC News Channel, Premier League, Top Gear, and others. And I've been offered these buyout contracts, and I've always refused them because it's a race to the bottom once you do. I, I remember um, being once asked to do some program. They didn't have much money, a, a phrase I'm sure all the composers in this room have heard before. And you go, all right, because they say, we've got this other series coming up, and we'll sort you out. Uh, so what subsequently happened is when they had no money, they rang me because I was the guy with, you know, so it, it doesn't work. It's a myth. It never happens. And I'm one of the lucky few. Copyright has been central to my living for about 40 years, and I would not be here now talking to you about this without it. The residual use of all the songs and pieces of music I've written over the years have enabled me to sustain my career. It's up to those of us who have been fortunate like myself not to give up our rights and be vocal about it. We must encourage the next generation of composers to be strong too. EXA, of course, is an ideal platform from which to do this. So let's be loud and proud of our work and our right to remuneration. I said remuneration, I got it right. I always stumble over that. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> it's an odd word, yeah. Close. Remuneration, so that's payment and or a financial compensation. Uh, we're actually gonna jump to you, Pauline. Uh, grab a microphone. Uh, Pauline, you are the uh, CEO for the Federation of European Film Directors. Um, and um, can you explain what the current situation is for film directors and how the directive could improve um, the situation? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me and sharing the stage with uh, um, our colleagues from the music sector, on the audiovisual sector, we've been in solidarity in this uh, fight for ages uh, since I took the job in, in 2014. And it's been um, both uh, rewarding, but also really very useful to us to share um, our experiences between two different sectors on the other side of the equation. Um, I mean, for me, the, the, basic, the basic truth that I want to put out there right now is that the directive has to make a change for our community. If it doesn't, um, the situation will become from bad to worse, and that is not an outcome that we can accept. So what I, I'm afraid this is really something that we have to make something of, and we are doing everything we can so that it actually happens. Um, just maybe... I mean, I know you're asking me about how things work for us in the audiovisual sector. Well, I mean, I think a lot of things that, Simon, you described are true also in our sector. Um, buyouts are malpractices, in our view, that have been going on in the audiovisual sector for a century. So that's, you know, <laughs> we know all about it <laughs> in various different forms. But I think in this day and age, the main issue that is in front of us is that because investment is necessary and risky in the audiovisual sector, the temptation to say, we want to limit the risk by paying creators on the production budget and then be done with it is huge. Especially when we face uh, new animals in the sector who are both producing and distributing internationally. Um, and, uh, and yes, I can, I can see the temptation when you control all the intellectual property you're producing for the users of your service, the temptation to never have this conversation ever again, but guess what, that's not gonna happen. We're not gonna let that happen. And the reason why we're not gonna let it happen is not just because it's fair 
or it's right. Uh, of course, you can talk principles all day, but the reality is that our people are facing a very long period of unpaid work, especially when they develop new projects. And if we don't have royalties payments, if we don't have uh, a share of the success of the works that our people have worked on previously, then there is simply no possibility for these people to go on doing their job, uh, being professionals and, and being uh, better and better at what they do and start new projects so that you know, the cycle of life can go on. So, uh, voila, for me, the basics is there. That's, that's really the premise that I feel sometimes people fail to understand. And what I'd like to stress now that we have, in a way, recognized this uh, in a legal text at European level, is that risk-taking requires success sharing at some point. And I think that's something that we are tremendously happy with. I don't think it, I know it. Um, the market regulation aspect of the directive you mentioned, Marco, I know it's, it's tough. I know it's tough on business to, to admit that at some point a regulation of business practices might be needed. But I'm afraid that one of the cases we were making during the development of the legislation is that the situation has gone so bad in terms of remuneration for our community across Europe that market regulation is now necessary in that area. And we are very happy to have it. We will see what it will come to in practice. But the recognition that there is a systemic weak bargaining position of authors when they negotiate their contracts, it's a very long sentence that I swear I have repeated maybe 20,000 times over the last five years, but it is always true today. It was true in 2014, it's true today. It was true 50 years ago. And it's really, for us, it's an incredible step forward to have the European Union recognizing it. Now, I also am aware of the fact that there are a lot of concepts in there that 